Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, definitely hit that notification bell button so that you don't miss any videos of mine. And if you have any cool case suggestions, definitely leave them in the comments down below. I would love to hear your guys' suggestions. So today's case is one that I found super interesting. It takes place in Texas and it all began when two suitcases were found. Inside those suitcases were the bodies of two young women. Let's get into it. On 13th September 2005, workers at the Lubbock City landfill, they noticed a suitcase amongst all the trash and that was something that really stood out to them. They found it really strange that someone would throw away the suitcase given that it looked kind of new. And now this isn't something that they see every day, you know, they're amongst a bunch of trash every day and they don't really see a suitcase. So they decided that this was something super unusual and that they wanted to just check it out and look inside. However, when they opened this suitcase up, they made a horrifying discovery. Inside, folded and in a fetal position, was the body of a naked and brutally battered young woman. The workers who, you know, made the discovery, they later on gave interviews and statements saying that they still remember the smell that hit them till this day. And when they first opened it up, they actually thought it was just like a practical joke. They thought, you know, it was probably just a mannequin or someone trying to be funny in a gory way because apparently it's super common to find um mannequins in in landfills but they realized soon that you know along with the smell that it wasn't a mannequin so when they realized that you know it wasn't a prank by college students or you know someone trying to be funny they immediately call the police so the police come investigators start investigating and they realize they have this you know, naked woman's body with nothing really to identify her with. There was not much like biological or physical evidence that was actually left behind. Really not many clues, but the one thing they did have was an ankle tattoo on this woman's body that they could try and maybe see if that was going to lead them anywhere. So the main thing that they really went on was this ankle tattoo and her fingerprints. And through this, they were actually able to identify her. The Ankle tattoo had the word summer written on it. And they also, you know, ran her fingerprints through the database. So when this woman's body was taken into the medical examiner, there were a few things that they learned from the autopsy. So this woman had been severely beaten. She had over 50 blunt force trauma um, wounds all over her body. The wounds on her head were the worst, you know, seems like that's where the initial blows were. She had signs of being strangled and she was also found to be raped um, in multiple areas. And the crazy thing is in this autopsy, they also found that she was currently, or at the time of her death, she was 10 weeks pregnant. So now due to this fact, this now made this case a capital murder case. Now, one of the most horrific things for the investigators of this case was that this woman's cause of death was not determined to be, you know, blunt force trauma or um, asphyxiation as they initially thought from looking at the body. She actually died from positional asphyxia, which basically means like the way she was positioned in the suitcase caused her death. So in other words, she was still alive when she was stuffed inside that suitcase by her killer. Now, like I said, they were able to determine, you know, the identification of this woman and they identified her as mother of four Summer Lee Baldwin and she was 29 years old. She was um, originally from Tacoma, Washington, and she had been going through a sort of rough stage in her life around that time. And this was due to drug addiction and she turned to sex work to fuel this drug addiction. So, you know, at this point they knew the victim, they knew how she died, they knew she was pregnant, you know, but the question was who did this and who could have done it, why? The person, you know, that did this was clearly not viewing Summer as a human being. I mean, they just dumped her in the landfill in a suitcase like she was another piece of trash. 
So along with the landfill workers, detectives also agreed that the suitcase that Summer was placed in looked really new. It looked, it didn't look like a used suitcase. And the plastic tag on the handle was still there and the interior of the suitcase looked really clean. And inside the suitcase was a small paper like tag with what appeared to be the UPC number of the suitcase was like there for them to identify the suitcase with. And this UPC number is basically like a unique product code, like it's a product code for each item sold. So from there, detectives went and tried to determine what areas of Lubbock would this suitcase have been sold from. So detectives spoke to many different areas in Lubbock, many different stores, I mean, and they determined that this particular suitcase was only sold at Walmarts. So then when they went and investigated further, the Walmart employees were like, there was only two of these suitcases like sold around that time. And Walmart gave the police video, like CCTV footage of those two purchases. One buyer was just a woman and another was a Hispanic man and he had like a shaved head. He was wearing a green shirt and together with the suitcase, he also purchased latex gloves. The man had also been seen getting into a red pickup truck and they didn't have a name for this guy, but they real like they noted that he made this purchase at 3.30 a.m. for a suitcase and latex gloves. And he was extremely calm. He was extremely collected. And he even like ripped the paper, the paperwork like tag off the suitcase from the cashier as he was buying it. And the woman was, you know, the woman that bought the suitcase, she was immediately ruled out because it genuinely looked like she was purchasing a suitcase for herself. Now, the man, the reason why he was, you know, looked at and one of his first mistakes was that he bought this suitcase using and the latex gloves using his debit card. Through a federal subpoena, the police ended up obtaining his name. So this guy, his name was Rosendo Rodriguez III, and he was 25 years old. He was a native of Wichita Falls, Texas, and he attended the Texas Tech University, which was in Lubbock, and he was now, well, currently living in San Antonio. He was in the Marine Corps Reserves, and he had come to Lubbock County for his monthly training the weekend that Summer was murdered. He was staying at the Holiday Inn where he checked in on September 9th, 2005, which was strange because he chose to stay at a different um, hotel than where the rest of his unit was staying. And when he checked in, he actually gave a different name to the front desk. He gave the name of Thomas Rodriguez. Now, he didn't have a criminal record, but he wasn't new to the police. His name had actually come up in connection with the 2004 disappearance of another young girl in Lubbock as well, but he was never really considered a serious suspect in that case. But now, obviously, you know, things weren't looking so good for him. On September 15th, 2005, two days after Summer's body was found, uh, Rosendo was actually arrested because the police moved super quick. And detectives actually went in many different directions to try and collect evidence. So they went to San Antonio, which is where he lived. They went to Midland, which is where I think the previous girl was from. Then they also went to that Holiday Inn. Rosendo was arrested in San Antonio. And as soon as he was arrested, he immediately asked for a lawyer. He was like, straight away, I want a lawyer. He just knew. Now in San Antonio, this house that he lived in was actually, you know, a house that he shared with his parents. And several pieces of evidence were actually collected from this house, including his computer, his phone, a bus ticket receipt, and a receipt for a rental car agreement for a red pickup truck. They also collected a green t-shirt of his that he was seen wearing at the Walmart when he was purchasing the suitcase and the latex gloves. And the police, they were so thorough in their investigation that they even went and processed that red Uh, pickup truck that he rented and they collected evidence from that vehicle as well. So all these pieces put together were, you know, formed as part of evidence relating to Summer Baldwin's murder. Then in the Holiday Inn hotel room, there was a number of like incriminating pieces of evidence that they found there. They found blood in the room and then they also found blood in a trash can outside the room. They found latex gloves with Summer's blood on it and Rosendo's DNA on it. So the detective for like on this case, he actually wrote this huge article like outlining the whole process and what they found and everything. And he actually stated like, okay, well, how did we find so much evidence in a hotel room, right? Like doesn't the maid clean up the hotel room? How did the maid not see the blood? 
And he says the first thing that he always does when he enters a hotel room is he takes off the bedspread and looks underneath. And then you know how they express clean a room? Well, express cleaning is literally just that. The maids usually have to be in and out of the room in like seven minutes. So how can you clean a room in seven minutes? And that's why the blood wasn't discovered. Now, back at the Holiday Inn, the police also found out and discovered that when a key card is used um, for a room, a report is generated. So the report showed that Rosendo entered his room at around 12.30 a.m. the night that Summer was murdered. And then a witness had come forward and said that they had seen Summer walking and getting into a car and driving around with a Hispanic man in a red pickup truck. I mean, you couldn't even get like a more subtle car, but a red pickup truck. That night that Summer was killed at midnight. That's when the witness saw Summer. Then the key card showed Rosendo re-entering that same room at 3.50 a.m. that same morning. And comparing it to the Walmart footage, that was about 20 minutes after he bought the suitcase at Walmart. Then after buying the suitcase, returning to the room, he leaves the room again. And then he only returns to the room like the next day, sometime that morning. And then he finishes the day um, eating like two Chick-fil-A combos in his room. And then he watches some movie. Then on his computer at home, they found searches for the name Summer Baldwin and also news articles and stories referring to how her body was discovered at the landfill. Then, like in the same sentence, essentially, they found um, further searches on his computer relating to like singles websites and military singles and all these other dating websites, literally in the same breath that he was looking for a dead girl's body on the news. At this point, the police were like, oh my God, we are discovering what type of an individual he really is. So like I said, when Rosendo was arrested, he lawyered up straight away. And about two weeks after he was arrested, his lawyer actually contacts the investigators and hands over two knives that belonged to Summer Baldwin. And he also tells the detectives like, okay, well, my client wishes to speak with you. Rosendo's story about what happened that night went as follows. He says that Summer Baldwin and him had consensual sex. And after they had, you know, their sex, Summer started smoking crack. Now, Rosendo is a really good citizen. So when she started smoking crack, he was really offended by this. He stated he grabbed the crack pipe off her. And that's when Summer came at him and attacked him with two knives. It was at this point when she attacked him with the knives is, is when he put her into a chokehold. And that's how she ended up dying. It was an accident. He was defending himself and, you know, this is what happened. Now, police obviously had the autopsy results and they knew that this was bullshit. What about all the injuries on her body? What about the fact that she died from positional asphyxia? And if he just choked her, why was there blood all over the hotel room? Why were there latex gloves? However, they were just happy that he was giving them, you know, some sort of confession on video because that's what they really cared about, especially they wanted on video and on tape him saying that he was with Summer when she died. Now, when this investigation <clears throat> for Summer Baldwin was going on, the DA, Matt Powell, he couldn't help but think about another case that he had, you know, been investigating. And he just kept thinking like, maybe this has something to do with it. There was a 16 year old girl that was missing since May 2004, and it had been like nearly two years at this point. Her name was Joanna Rogers, and she had last been seen at her parents' home around midnight the night that she went missing. And Rosendo's name, remember I said his name popped up in a, in a case prior. The reason why his name popped up is because with Joanna Rogers, he was actually on an online dating like chat website with her. And he had, you know, he had been investigated into that, but nothing really came out of it because Joanna was still missing. The DA said, you know, that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach when you know someone has done something bad, but you just don't have the evidence, like, but you just know that's exactly how he felt with Rosendo. He felt it was extremely important for the community and for Joanna's family to find Joanna if they had that opportunity, if they were in the presence of someone who knew something about her disappearance. 
So then he ends up speaking to Summer's family, explains the situation like, look, this guy might be involved in the disappearance of another 16-year-old girl. He even speaks with Joanna's family and he's like, look, you know, I think this guy might know more than what he's saying. So basically after speaking with both of the families, he the DA, he characterizes what essentially he made was a deal with the devil. He then goes to Rosendo's attorney and he says, if your client has anything to do with Joanna Rogers' disappearance, you need to tell us. If Rosendo's information leads us to actually finding Joanna's body, we, you know, in the case of Summer Baldwin, we will reduce your sentence to life in prison and we'll take the death penalty off the table. And it was sort of a promise, you know, we're not going to pursue the death penalty if we find Joanna's body with your information. And, you know, that was something that he wasn't happy to do. But like he said, he had to make a deal with the devil for the greater good of both the families. And the DA does state that both Joanna's family and Summer's family were both in agreement with this. They were trusting the DA 100% that he was doing the right thing. And it was a huge, tremendous help for him because he wanted to make sure that he wasn't disappointing anyone, you know? Because a lot of the time, like, this is a really hard thing if you think about it for Summer's family. I mean, it's hard for both families, but if you think about it in Summer's family's view, her body was already found. They had sufficient DNA to convict the killer. They probably were super angry and they wanted Rosendo dead. They probably wanted the death penalty on the table, knowing that he would never be able to do this again to anyone else. But it seems like Summer's family, once they knew about, you know, Joanna, they were also thinking of Joanna's family too. If what had happened to Joanna had actually happened to Summer. I mean, it. from what they know, they don't know any information at that point, but, you know, if Summer was still missing, what would they want? Essentially taking the death penalty off the table for Summer's killer, they knew that they were helping Joanna's family because if this could lead to finding Joanna, then her family could also have closure the same way Summer's family had closure. So I hope that makes sense because it's a really, like, I feel like it would have been a really tough decision for Summer's family to make, but both families, because even Joanna's family, she's they're probably like, if he was the one that did it, I want him to have the death penalty. So anyway, Rosendo, he obviously agrees to the deal. I mean, death penalty off the table. And then he tells the police that, yep, I did meet Joanna Rogers. I met her early that morning for consensual sex. We met on May 4th, 2004. And at the time, Rosendo was living in Lubbock County. And he only lived like 20 minutes away from Joanna at that time. And his story about meeting Joanna was actually confirmed um, through telephone records because it showed him calling Joanna's house exactly at the time. I think he made two phone calls exactly at the time he said that they, you know, had chose to meet up. He said that that night, you know, after these phone calls, Joanna, she's 16, by the way, he said Joanna came over to his house early that morning they immediately had sex, and then um, as soon as they had sex, she began demanding money from him. He refused, and he says that she immediately then began to blackmail him, telling him that she was going to go to the police now and tell the police that Rosendo had raped a 16-year-old little girl. He says they then, you know, immediately began to fight, and that's when he choked her, causing her death. He says he then went up to his room. He found, you know, a spare suitcase essentially and then he puts her body into the suitcase he then takes this suitcase with her body in it and he throws joanna in a dumpster the da says that when um rosendo was talking about what he did to joanna he was just talking about it like like they were having a cup of coffee and he was just like talking about this random encounter with a girl that took place he was so casual about it the da says that when he was recalling this story about joanna he felt sick to his stomach. He said at that point, he was like, oh, why did I take the death penalty off the table? Because he felt like there was no person more deserving than Rosendo to receive the death sentence at this point. No one that he could think of. But then at the same time, it was like a double-edged sword because he was like, if I didn't offer this, we never would have fi found out what happened to Joanna. And the hard part to this case was just beginning at the time. So now the landfill, you know, keeps pretty good records of its trash collection and stuff 
at the time. Like they know exactly where everything goes and things like that. So through Rosendo's confession, detectives figured out exactly, you know, what area of the landfill Joanna's body would have been in and the approximate area of the landfill that the dumpster she was in would have been emptied into. The problem was, is that they were talking about an area. So like they figured out the, you know, the math to it, but the area that they had to search was like multiple football field like lengths in size. And on top of that, it had two years worth of garbage stacked on top of it. Searching for Joanna's body was literally like searching for a needle in a haystack. So the sheriff, uh, David Gutierrez and Pam Alexander, who was a victim's advocate, they secured a grant from the governor's office for over $100,000 to help in the cost of searching through this giant landfill. The real, you know, heroes in this, to be honest, were the men and women who actually searched through the landfill. They risked multiple illnesses searching through all that. You know, they had to endure shots to be able to actually put themselves in the, that position around all that trash. Wearing full body suits, like full body suits in hundred degree temperatures daily to help search for the body of Joanna. They honestly had to go through horrific things in this landfill just to find Joanna, but you know, they were willing to do it. They wanted to help. So now it's been two months into the search and they don't find anything. And they were running out of money, you know, to help with the search. And they were also in their last like pocket of the landfill like area that they were supposed to search. They were in that last little piece of um, the landfill and they were like, oh my God, we're not going to find anything. And at this point, the search, like from all the authorities, they were like, we need to call it off. Like, it's taking up too much money, too much resources, and these people are like risking their lives. We need to just stop this now. Then as soon as that was sort of announced, they found their needle in a haystack. Another black suitcase was recovered. This time it contained the body of a young girl with beautiful red hair, and this was Joanna Rogers. 904 days since Joanna went missing, they finally brought her home. Finally, Joanna Rogers' family, you know, her parents, were able to bring their daughter home and able to say goodbye to her. It's hard enough to lose a child. I mean, these these parents that go through this, like it's hard enough to lose a child, but to not know what happened to them, to not know where they are for that period of time. There are people who like much longer than two years, you know, and it's like, it must be so freaking difficult. They found Joanna's body. They had a summer's killer. They knew Joanna's killer. And, you know, the defendant just had to plead now. And on the day of Rosendo's plea, like when it was supposed to take place, the uh, defense's counsel, so Rosendo, Rosendo's lawyers, they came up to the DA and they were like, look, we're not so sure that this plea is going to happen. Because remember, he was supposed to plead guilty um, if he um, revealed Joanna's, you know, where he dumped her body. And the defense now was like, look, we don't know if this is going to happen. So at this hearing, Rosendo, who was a highly intelligent individual, he was in the Marines. He now chose to state that at the time of making the deal with the DA, he did not know what was going on. He didn't know what he was agreeing to, and he would now not enter a guilty plea. So he wanted to now plead not guilty to both the crimes. Like, okay, you're evidence is everywhere, but okay. But because of this, the DA was like, okay, all bets are off. I'm withdrawing my offer now. And now we're going to put, put the death penalty back on the table. The DA was happy. He's like, we're now going to get the best of both worlds. We found Joanna. And now we're going to let a jury decide whether Rosendo should get the death penalty or not. It's up to them now. So now given the media attention, this case actually received in Lubbock County, they were like, obviously we can't try him here, everybody, you know, knew about the case and 90% of people already made up their mind about the trial, which I think is fair considering that he was the one that did it. So the trial was then moved to Randall County, which was like a hundred miles away. Now, just a note about Rosendo's trial, the statement in which he confessed to, you know, what happened to Joanna, she came to his house, they had sex, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was not considered a voluntary statement because it was part of a plea agreement. So even though he backed out of this plea deal, it was inadmissible in court, which I think is ridiculous. So at this stage, Rosendo is going to um, trial for Summer Baldwin's murder because, you know, he confessed on that, but not for Joanna's because that statement does not 
doesn't mean anything anymore. And even the DA was like, this is a messed up like area of our law. Like, and it is because he freaking confessed to it. They found Joanna's body based on this confession, which means that it was true or somewhat true. You know, I'm sure there are, there are like, you know, loopholes, but it was a stupid, I think that's stupid. So they picked a jury in about four weeks and then the trial started and they had indicted um, Rosendo on multiple paragraphs is what they call it, which I found, I've never heard that before. So paragraph one alleged murder taking place during a sexual assault. Paragraph two alleged the murder of two or more individuals. And that's relating to Summer because it's Summer Summer's murder. And then also her unborn baby was classified a person. So two murders. And then paragraph three was Rosendo was being indicted for killing a child under the age of six being the unborn baby. So in the trial, they actually ended up waiving paragraph three, which was killing a child under the age of six. And then they proceeded with the first two. He was then indicted on two charges. The first being murder during sexual assault and the second being um, the murder of two or more individuals. Now, both of these charges are punishable by death in the state of Texas. So the DA was pretty happy about that. Now, the obvious issues were, and you know, you guys, we've discussed this before, was convincing a jury that in fact, <laughs> you can, you know, sexually assault a prostitute. A lot of people think you cannot, but you can. And the second was that um, they had to prove that Rosendo, not knowing that Summer was pregnant, didn't like let him off on the charge of murdering two people. Like just because he didn't know she was pregnant doesn't um, make him not have to take accountability for the fetus. Like too bad. You can't just do what you like. And then they also had to deal with the self-defense claim where Rosendo was saying that Summer attacked him with the two knives. Now, the strange thing to me about this whole thing, about the whole, you know, you can't rape a prostitute is like, well, what doesn't make sense to me about that is like, she's offering a service, right? Or a product, whatever, whatever you want to call it. She's offering a service technically. So if you go into, you know, a hairdresser's, um, like you go into a hairdressing shop, what am I trying to say? You go into a salon <laughs> and you force the hairdresser to give you a haircut and then you leave. Isn't that a crime? Like, I know it's a stupid comparison, but Summer is offering sexual services to get paid and she has to voluntarily give it to you, voluntarily give it to you. If you rape her, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, I don't know. It's just stupid. Like when you think of it like that, it's a stupid, stupid argument that you even have to make. Like it's, I think that's stupid. So anyway, to prove the first charge, the sexual assault, you know, during murder charge, they relied on all the forensic evidence and the physical, you know, evidence. Summer had so many, you know, injuries on her body, blows to her back, stomach, legs, face, really, you know, bad blows to her head. She also had blunt force injuries to her genitals, like both areas, which obviously would be counted as a sexual assault. The, you know, these injuries alone mean a sexual assault took place. I mean, that was not consensual. Who wants that to happen to them? She had suffered severe enough injuries to lose consciousness enough to be put into the suitcase, but not enough to cause her death. And this led to the pathologist coming to the, to the determination that she was alive when she was put into that suitcase and she died from positional asphyxia. Now, when the pathologist testified this piece of evidence, it was the first time that the jury had actually ever heard this fact that she was stuffed into the suitcase alive and she died from like the positioning of her body. And, you know, based on their reactions, it was also the first time that Rosendo and his um, defense attorney had heard this fact too, because maybe, I don't know why they didn't know about it before. They would have definitely been given access to the forensic reports prior to the trial. And this testimony from the pathologist destroyed Rosendo's claim that it was self-defense, um, that Summer, you know, attacked him with a knife and he choked her out to death and it was an accident. It destroyed that. And on top of that, the whole self-defense thing is so dumb because he had one tiny scratch on his body. Tiny scratch. In the second charge about murdering two people, they relied on um, a definition from the penal code of what an individual is. And an individual is a human being who is alive. Now, this includes an unborn child at every gestation, like from fertilization to embryo to fetus, everything. Like it includes every stage of a human being that is alive, right? So the closing argument for the DA was super easy. He was like, if you can't argue these facts, you're in the wrong business because 
Everything was laid out there for him. He remembers in the trial, nobody wanted to actually touch the suitcase because, you know, it still looked like um, what it had looked like when it was recovered from the landfill. It was dirty and, you know, it had been, had a body inside, but he just grabbed it with his bare hands. He didn't care. And he shows the jury, like, look, look at what you're looking at. This suitcase, this thing that everyone doesn't want to touch was meant to be the final resting place for Summer Baldwin. That's what the defendant's aim was. He then placed three roses on the suitcase. One rose was for Summer, one rose was for her unborn baby, and then one rose was for Joanna Rogers, who the defendant, um, the jury, they never got to hear about her, about her case. Now, at this point, most of the jury members, like, they were in tears, and this was more emotion than Rosendo had ever shown in the whole trial. The jury deliberated for less than three hours before coming back with the verdict that Rosendo Rodriguez was guilty for the rape and murder of Summer Baldwin. Now, while the DA was getting ready for, Ros for Rosendo's trial, he was constantly being contacted by people who had had contact with Rosendo in the past. These included his high school girlfriends who he had, you know, also sexually assaulted and four other women who he had terrorized and assaulted at Texas Tech University. And none of these rapes had been reported to the police. And I understand, you know, they're afraid. Rosendo's friends also testified that Rosendo was, you know, a man who had no problem getting any girls. And he saw sex as like a handshake. It was just an exchange. They also stated that Rosendo often bragged about how he slept with a bunch of prostitutes and how many kids he killed in Iraq. The only problem with that is that Rosendo, he had never been deployed. So what is he talking about? He literally thought that made him sound cool. And that kind of tells you his state of mind too, what he, what he found to be bragworthy. The rape victims basically told the same story to the DA that he would use his charm and like his personality to try and get you to sleep with him. However, you know, soon after the, the sex would suddenly turn super violent and Rosendo would continue to rape them despite their pleas to stop. They testified that the reason why they never told anyone about these rapes is because they were terrified of Rosendo and they felt that Rosendo knew the perfect people to choose as victims, people that wouldn't, you know, would be too afraid to report him. One of these victims told a completely different story. She said that she was attending Texas Tech and she was working three jobs and trying to just make it through. And she was just, you know, looking for a night of fun. So she goes to this frat house or sorority and then that's how she meets Rosendo. She was just trying to, you know, have fun during college because she had been working so hard. And when she met Rosendo, she was in that phase of her life, but she fell in love with him so quickly because of his charms. She said he did all the right things and he even went and asked her father um, for permission to date her. Like he, you know, was like a perfect gentleman. And then after she learned that he had been cheating on her, she was like, no, I'm not going to take that. So she dumped him. And the way she did this was she went to his apartment to confront him and, you know, be like, well, why are you cheating on me? And, you know, all that kind of stuff. And she was, the plan was to dump him. And when she did this, it was then that he grabbed her and he held her down on the couch and he raped her. And this was her first ever sexual experience. Like, can you imagine that? After this rape, he then walks her to her car. He pats her on the head and tells her to get in. And he's like, it's going to be all right. This victim says that that drive home was the longest 30 minutes of her entire life. She says she got home. She went into the house. She said goodnight to her parents as she normally did. She goes upstairs and then she goes into her closet in a fetal position. And she just like cried all night. Now, one of the best pieces of evidence was actually found on Rosendo's phone. They had taken um, like all the text messages and pictures off his phone, you know, in preparation for trial. And they found this one particular picture and it was a selfie of Rosendo. And he had taken this picture of himself. He was wearing mirrored sunglasses and he was smiling and he was wearing a green shirt. In the photo, he was actually on a bus back home to San Antonio. And he was wearing the same green shirt that he had been seen wearing in the Walmart footage when he picked up that suitcase and the latex gloves. This picture was taken the day after he killed Summer Baldwin, and it basically shows you his character. He's happy, he's smiling, he's on a bus. I mean, taking a photo of himself like he had just taken out the garbage. It was, Summer was nothing more to him than that. Now, like I said, they were never able to, you know, show 
or describe Rosendo's confession regarding Joanna Rogers. The law was clear. His statement was not considered voluntary because it was part of a plea agreement. And even though he backed out of the plea, that confession was still inadmissible in court. So during the end of the trial, Rosendo's family members and friends all came up and, you know, testified about how Rosendo is so caring and a sweet boy. And he was nothing like what the prosecution was painting him out to be like. They said he was super loving, caring, but, you know, although growing up in a sort of normal household, he did have a very abusive father who was a drunk. You know, this father of his beat all the kids in the home, including his mother. Now, the strange thing was that Rosendo's dad was in the courtroom for the whole trial. He had been a defense attorney for 20 plus years. And in the room, like during the trial, all his family members were hugging and kissing him, including his wife. I mean, the same man who they're painting out now to be this abusive person who beat everyone and who nobody liked, but everyone was holding his hand and hugging him and his wife of 36 years is there like loving on him in the courtroom, like looking to him for support. Like it just looked so stupid to the jury. Then the defense started saying like, you know, being in prison is a much safer, you know, place to live and it's good for rehabilitation and, you know, death penalty is not really an option. Like they were trying to, because they don't want him to get the death penalty. And, you know, when they did find him guilty, now at the sentencing hearing, they deliberated for two and a half hours. And when they came back, they decided that Rosendo should indeed get the death penalty. The prosecution was so happy because they got Joanna home too. They got justice for Summer and now Rosendo gets the death penalty. During the victim impact statement, the jury heard for the first time from Joanna's father that Rosendo killed Joanna because it had never been, remember, it had never been um talked about in court and the da says that some of the jury members looked like they wanted to jump across the rail and beat the shit out of rosendo so some of the family members of summer and joanna said that they are going to be present at the death penalty um not the death penalty at rosendo's death penalty like when he gets execution at rosendo's execution and the da says like out of all the cases he's tried like he might go and attend the execution of Rosendo as well. Rosendo's attorneys continued to fight. They filed numerous appeals on behalf of Rosendo. They questioned the credibility of the medical examiner. Like, was Summer really sexually assaulted? I mean, I don't even want to say what that medical report stated about her genitals. Like, if if he, if they're going to try and claim that that wasn't a sexual assault, like, you guys can read up on it. It's brutal. Brutal. Now, the reason why the defense was trying to make the medical examiner's report not credible is because that's what made that whole report is what made the case even eligible for the death penalty. They appealed to the Supreme Court, but that was rejected 30 minutes before Rosendo's execution. The appeal was described as improper, untimely, and it was just like a last ditch, last ditch effort to try and like save Rosendo. Now, one thing to note is that Rosendo never, ever, ever showed any remorse, never apologized to the families of Summer and Joanna, and he just didn't care. When asked, you know, before his execution, whether he had anything to say, he went on like a seven minute um, rant about how the death penalty should be abolished and how it's not right and blah, blah, blah. And he complained about how all his appeals were being rejected by the court and how it was unfair. And he made this statement that I want to read to you. He said, the state may have my body, but they never had my soul. I fought the good fight. I have run the good race. Warden, I'm ready to join my father. Like, you know how frustrating that would have been to be, to hear that as as, a, as one of the victim's families, like, he really was a monster. Rosendo Rodriguez was pronounced dead at 6.46 p.m. on March 27th, 2018. Ugh, you guys, like, me, normally I'm not for the de death penalty, not because I think it's like, I don't know, I usually feel like people should be in prison and pay for their crimes, like, they shouldn't be able to like die and then like just like do a crime and then just like die and then like not pay like that's I don't feel like it's punishment but in this case it's really better that Rosendo is just not on the planet anymore like he he was only 25 and doing this kind of stuff he was you know a dangerous man he got caught after killing two women but he had many many more victims I really believe that if he wasn't caught I mean that suitcase product code like that little code inside the suitcase saved the lives of many, many people. I really believe he would have continued killing women. It was a thing to him. 
And I mean, how many rapes did he commit? Like he never got charged for those. So I really believe that in this situation, the death penalty was used well. I hope that's not too. Ugh. What do you guys think about this case? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Hope you found this case interesting, guys, and I will see you in the next one. Besitos. Bye.